Today you're going to discover how an old timber boardwalk was re-engineered to make it safer, wider and more inclusive and how organising construction schedules and employing a top-down build approach helped minimise risk of environmental impact. Good morning and welcome to our webinar case study on the design and installation of Huskisson Mangrove uh, boardwalk. I'm Kelly Stewart, Marketing Manager at Wagner CFT, and I'm here with Structural Engineer Thomas Schoen from MI Engineers and Managing Director of ALI Civil, Cohen Jurgens. Tom has more than 15 years consulting engineering experience in small and medium-sized firms where he has managed structural projects for infrastructure, industrial, commercial and residential projects. Meanwhile, with more than 20 years experience in the civil construction industry, Cohen Jurgens has built a reputation for excellence, innovation and sustainable development, overseeing a range of projects from urban infrastructure to expansive residential development. Welcome Tom and Cohen. Before we get started, just a few webinar protocols. We are recording today's event and we'll make the recording public via the Wagner CFT YouTube channel. Uh, we are going to run through Tom and Cohen's presentations first and hold answering any questions until the end. Uh, you'll see at the top of your screen, there is a chat tab where you can submit a question anytime during the webinar. Those questions will be compiled for discussion during the Q&A session following Tom and Cohen's presentations. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce MI Engineering Structural Design Manager, Thomas Schoen. Good morning. Thanks for coming today. It's a pleasure to present this project to you all. Um, as Kelly said, my name is Tom Schoen, the Structural Design Manager at MI Engineers. Um, I'll just give you a brief background of MI Engineers. We've been a uh, established, uh, set up on the south coast uh, for over 35 years, um, started off in Bury. We initially started as a consulting company and then moved into cost engineering and contract administration, as well as the design and project management. Uh, MI Engineers has since opened offices in Sydney, Wollongong, and also Manchester in England. Uh, MI Engineers and German Civil have been working closely together over many years, building a mutual respect for each other's expertise and industry knowledge, forming a productive relationship with a great team to take on challenging projects such as this. Um, this project is located uh, south of Sydney, in Huskinson, you can see here, the red dot, about uh, two and a half hours south of Sydney, uh, located on Currumbin Creek, which is just off Jervis Bay Marine Park. There are several challenges uh, with this project, primarily the beautiful location, challenging access and strict environmental controls. Most of these were negotiated by Cohen and his team, so I'll try not to double up and I'll talk mainly to the design. Uh, Cohen produced the process to construct the boardwalk and through collabor collaboration we produced the design to facilitate the top-down construction. The new boardwalk was required to be in the footprint of the same as the original with the allowance to increase the width for better function. The structure was designed to be modular in three meter sections which would allow for the structural members to be cut to size prior arriving on site. The pre-cutting reduced waste on site and reduced the risk of any impact on the environment. The decision to utilise Wagner's products was made as to provide a maintenance free solution which will last at least the 50 year design life in the coastal tidal environment. The original boardwalk was 1.2 metres wide and um, 
winding through the mangrove forest. The timber had come to the end of its life and was becoming a burden to maintain. The original construction was carried out without much consideration for the environment, which Karen will touch on. The original boardwalk had no handrail, no passing bays and restricted its use. The original alignment had several changes in direction as part of the design. We tried to rationalise these, maintaining straight runs where possible. We also had to review some of the tighter turns with consideration for the excavator to move around. The long section was required to be accurately set out to allow for piling to be set up by the surveyor and to achieve an accurate cut list for Wagners. The new design also incorporated two new, two new viewing platforms to allow people to, groups of people to con congregate and act as additional passing bays. The decision to extend the boardwalk was made by council and approved by DPI um, to get closer to Currumbin Creek, creating new views to Huskinson and along the creek. The new boardwalk was increased in width to 1.8 metres and allowed for two wheelchairs to pass. A handrail was provided on one side to increase accessibility. However, the choice to maintain a free edge as to keep the connection with the surrounding environment was agreed to by council. This was justified by less than one metre fall onto soft sandy medium and shallow waters with the possibility to walk to the bank and exit the mud flats quite easily. The installation of ladders was discussed, but it was agreed they should not be included as to, as to discourage people from accessing the mangrove mudflats. Access for the machinery and therefore foundation design was uh, always a challenge on this project. The title aspect made the foundation design critical. After exploring several options, uh, we ended up on sleeved and capped screw piles with sufficient thickness to provide the required design life of 50 years. Given the Wagner CHS sizing, careful consideration of the screw pile member sizing was also required to ensure a snug but achievable fit. The screw pile method also eliminated the risk of exposing acid sulfate soils and reduced the impact of the surrounding environment by eliminating any spoil. The process would consist of dem demolishing a section of the boardwalk, then to construct one three metre section allowing for the excavator to track over the boardwalk to then install the next set of piles and three metre section of boardwalk. This presented the challenge to then design the boardwalk for the 3.5 tonne excavator to track across, which also created lateral loading on the decking, which had to be considered, and uh, various point loads from the action of installing the piles. The design of the joist to support the excavator was a major consideration, but also the lateral and point loading exerted from the, the screw pile installation. Doubling up the joist provided sufficient strength to support the excavator, which the tracks with the track spread over the two joists. We then designed the Wagner CHS sections to sleeve over the screw piles and cantilever off the pile to support headstocks. Due to the low height of the boardwalk, uh, bracing wasn't required. Uh, this sleeve also provided protection to the screw pile in the tidal zone, helping to achieve the required design line. Uh, the design of the boardwalk, once the loading was established, was otherwise relatively straightforward, utilising the extensive Wagner's design guide. Here's some of the design drawings showing the platform arrangements. And we've also got the, the extension for the new viewing platform at the end of the creek creating the new views towards Huskisson and along the creek. So we've just got a brief video here as well of the boardwalk. This is prior to completion. So you can see, um, now I've got a handrail on the side, grab rail on the side there, sorry. See the uh, beautiful location and the challenging access. The, um, crystal clear waters. Yeah, walking along here. So. We Sorry, Kelly. Yeah, I was going to say we might have trouble showing that video, um, Tom. It doesn't look like it's showing at this end, but okay. um, we'll we'll add that with the follow up email and send it to everybody so that they <clears> can see it. I'll get you get it off you. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. I can send that through. I think it's quite large, which is yeah, probably half the issue. Yep, no worries. I'll just stop that then. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. That's the end of your presentation. Um, 
We're going to dive straight into the presentation from um, Cohen. Uh, I'm just going to get it up for you now, Cohen. Just a reminder at this point, um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat box at the top um, and uh, we'll answer those when we get to the Q&A section at the end. I'd now like to introduce Managing Director of ALI Civil, uh, Colin Jurgens. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us with this in this webinar to uh, go through the Huskers and Mangrove Boardwalk. Uh, which we construct conjointly with MI Engineers and Wagners. Uh, I'm Cohen Jurgens, the Managing Director of ALI Civil Pride Limited. Uh, ALI was established in 2019 uh, by myself and Darren Brown to provide local, local government agencies with a supply nation certified civil construction company with um, diverse capability skill sets. ALI is an Indigenous owned civil construction company and we're based in the Shellhaven. Uh, we provide services throughout uh, New South Wales, uh, both coastal and regional. Uh, ALI has, a, has considerable experience in marine construction, civil construction, and we focus on accessibility infrastructure projects in challenging environments. Uh, some of our clients include the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service, Director of National Parks, uh, Boudoirie National Park, uh, Department of Defence, Crown Lands and Shilhaven City Council. <coughs> um, a little bit about the boardwalk and its history. Uh, the original Hussles and Mangrove boardwalk was built in 1991. It's located in Jervis Bay Marine Park uh, in New South Wales, which is approximately two hours south of Sydney. Uh, the original boardwalk was 300 metres long. It was constructed from treated softwoods and hardwoods and the below information um, we received from the original construction team uh, which identified that the boardwalk was constructed in approximately six weeks uh, cost the pricely sum of $37,000 um, yeah that equates to about $123 a lineal meter which is nearly uh, inconceivable today um, but yeah, they uh, it came to the end of its life and it was time to be replaced. Uh, since its construction, the boardwalk has been a uh, major drawcard for the community of Huskisson. It's been visited by tens of thousands of people since its opening in 1991. Uh, the boardwalk gently meanders through the established mangrove forest on the tidal flats of Currambeen Creek. Uh, when the tide floods in to this forest, the mangroves uh, come to life with brim, mullet, blackfish, whiting crabs, stingrays, and birds like the white-faced heron, oyster catchers, uh, the threatened or endangered eastern curlews, and many more that come into feed on the flooded mangrove forest. Uh, from approximately 2007 onwards, the boardwalk was starting to reach the end of its life and was becoming increasingly costly to maintain and keep open to the public. Uh, the Shalhaven City Council was successful in gaining grant funding uh, from a New South Wales state government funding body to construct the new boardwalk to replace the dilapidated timber one. Um, the location of the project raised quite a few design and construction obstacles for the Shilhaven City Council and they elected to send it to open tender on a design and construct basis. Uh, the project itself, so ALI worked uh, in with MI in close collaboration in developing a concept design and construction methodology, which saw ALI uh, awarded the project by Shalaman City Council. This uh, site had considerable design and construction methodology rest restraints, uh, and they were attributed to the location of the boardwalk. Um, the boardwalk is located within the boundary of the Jervis Bay Marine Park. Uh, the project site was located within a sanctuary zone of that marine park. Within that sanctuary zone, uh, we had significant habitat of the threatened black estuary cod, uh, the significant habitat of the endangered eastern curlew at the project site, and there's also an extremely mature and dense mangrove forest. Uh, on top of that, we had acid sulfite soils and some pretty poor ground conditions to work with. Uh, initially, ALI engaged Peter Damazzo to provide a site-specific 
uh, review of environmental effects report to get a clear understanding of the environmental considerations which need to be addressed during the design and construction process development. Uh, this required us to reverse engineer the design and construction methodology to accommodate the environmental constraints. Um, it was a similar circumstance with the ground conditions. The site was identified in the New South Wales acid sulphate soils mapping to have had a high risk rating for high levels of acid sulphate soils. Um, from the onset of the commencement of this project, uh, our intention was to keep all the major stakeholders and authorities involved and informed during the design development. <coughs> um, myself and Tom work with the Department of Primary Industries, uh, Huskisson Fisheries Office and the Jervis Bay Marine Park Authority uh, through the development of the design to ensure they were comfortable with our proposals. Uh, involving these departments from the commencement was key for us as without the continuous communication, the design reviews, uh, the permitting process which was required to be issued to us by them would have been significantly delayed. Uh, the design process, which was headed up by Thomas Schoen from MI Engineers and myself, uh, focused on the site constraints and the most effective way to mitigate those risks without compromising on the strength, durability and aesthetics of the site. Uh, our first obstacle was site access. The existing boardwalk was to be removed and the new boardwalk was to be constructed in the exact same or similar alignment. Uh, as part of the DPI permit consent, no personnel or equipment were allowed to access the mudflats mud flats in the sanctuary zone during construction at any time. Um, this saw us adopt a top-down construction process and we designed the spans and member sizing to accommodate the construction equipment weights and to correlate um, the pile spacing with the existing piles. Uh, traditionally driven piles <coughs> and a you know, one to two metre pilot hole would have been utilised in this type of installation. Um, the process would have required exposure, that process would have ex required exposure of the acid sulphide soils, which was not permitted and which ruled out the um, option of using overhead piling equipment. Uh, MI and ALI decided to utilise screw tiles to mitigate both these obstacles. There's a few um, images there of the close up pile details with screw piles and how the sleeving and um, fixing arrangement was installed. Uh, the boardwalk construction was a systematic process and was fully compliant with the environmental conditions of the consent outlined in the DPI and Jervis Bay Marine Park Authority permits. Uh, all the vegetation which required removal was identified um, with the DPI officer and, the, uh, and this was entered into the vegetation removal uh, plan um, to mitigate the risks of uh, impacting the, uh, the mud flats, mangroves and um, the sanctuary zone environment. We fabricated site specific supports that sort of suspended the walking platforms uh, above the mud flaps, mud, mud flats with um, with enough clearance to allow us to work uh, generally in gum boots or waders uh, around all tides. Uh, this yeah this reduced the impact of the soil profile and the mangrove mangrove shoots, which was a requirement of the the permit conditions. And so a silk curtain with a floating hydrocarbon boom was installed around each section of the boardwalk to be constructed prior to dem demolition of that section. Um, the decking and joists were removed, working between the existing piles and the boardwalk that was being constructed. Uh, this waste material was placed into site transport trolleys and taken to our construction hard stand uh, to be palletised and uh, removed and disposed of site. The piles were cut off above the mud, flat, mud flats from the access platforms uh, with a hydraulic chainsaw powered by the 3.5 tonne excavator that was being utilised for the uh, screw pile installation. Uh, this is another requirement that the piles were not to be withdrawn from the soil or the um, the mudflats to ensure that no risk from the acid sulphate soils was introduced into the environment. Uh, so the, um, the CHS pile sleeves, once the screw, screw piles were in, the CHS pile sleeves were installed 
over over the top and pushed uh, approximately 600 mil into the um, soil profile uh, to ensure that no steel was exposed in the tidal zone. The piles were drilled on site, fastened uh, with stainless steel bolts uh, through both members and each pile. Uh, all the uh, headstocks were pre-drilled for efficiency by uh, Wagner's, and this enabled assembly to be quite quite efficient. Um, it also reduced the, list, uh, the release of debris from drilling on site into the environment. Uh, once the piles on headstocks were installed, the joists were installed and secured with the angle brackets. Um, in locations where the boardwalk was to change direction, we actually installed uh, longer headstocks to allow us to traverse the machine around the corner uh, more easily and without putting um, excessive load onto the pile sets of that changed location. Uh, with significant changes of location, we installed additional sets of piles to uh, make that transfer or, or transition a little bit easier. Um, <clears throat> once the joints, um, once the joists were installed, the decking was placed and they were fastened to allow us to continue. Um, temporary decking protection measures were installed to, prior to the excavator progressing to the next section. Um, the first set of working platforms would be picked up, picked up and shifted to the next removal installation area, followed by the silk curtain and the floating hydrocarbon boom. And we basically disrepeated this process throughout the entirety of the boardwalk. Once the boardwalk structure and decking were complete, uh, the handrail and grab rails were installed from the end of the boardwalk back to its commencement. Uh, we installed Aboriginal and cultural significance and traditional usage information signs uh, at the three viewing platforms and then connectivity footpaths and landscaping completed the project. Um, the project was well received by the governing authorities, the community, uh, Shalhaven City Council, uh, it was also adjacent to the Jervis Bay Maritime Museum, uh, which sort of added to their uh, their facility and created a, a bit of buzz from their end. Um, ALI were really proud to partner with MI and Wagner's to create this fantastic public asset, and we are hopefully looking to work together again in the future on similar similarly challenging projects throughout New South Wales. Uh, thanks very much. Wonderful, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm just going to uh, stop sharing that. We're about to go into the Q&A uh, session and I'm just gonna introduce Wagner's CFT General Manager, uh, Ryan Leeson, who is going to facilitate the Q&A uh, session today. Um, Ryan, I'll let you take it away because we've got a host of great questions there to ask the, the team. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Co and M Tom, for your presentation so far. I've uh, learned a thing or two myself, which is always great. Um, firstly, for you, Cohen, um, had you done a top-down build before, and and how successful was it for you? Obviously, with the um, ever-increasing environmental constraints that we we operate in in our construction environment, it's uh, fantastic to see these sort of innovative solutions you came up with to to work around it. Uh, no, this is the first time we were involved in the top-down construction process. Um, the boardwalks we've constructed previously have been in lesser critical environmental locations. This one, this one being with inside the Jervis Bay Marine Park and inside the sanctuary zone with endangered and threatened uh, species, uh, it was it was that was the only option we had, and um, the the inclusion of the um, screw piles as opposed to the driven piles was imperative due to the acid sulfate soils risk that were which was present on site. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. And Craig submitted a question here uh, just to clarify what was the length of the boardwalk um, that was replaced? And I know there was a, a further extension that you did. So maybe if you can just break down what those two lengths were for us. So the original boardwalk was approximately 300 metres long. And I think this one. Uh, is finished up at about 324 metres long in total. That was a, to include the extension of the final viewing platform at the end of the boardwalk. And there was a minor extension to the, there's a branch um, boardwalk that comes off the main boardwalk and it's it required a small extension to get to um, a suitable soil profile and the embankment. 
Okay, thank you. And again, from Craig, um, what was the what was the build time frame? And maybe if you can break down for us what the sort of design and approvals window was, and then what your actual time on site was. Sure. So um, design process, um, collaboration with MI and ourselves, uh, DPI, uh, the Jervis Bay Marine Park Authority, and our council uh, project managers and overseas was approximately two and a half months. Um, and then a construction time frame so from start to finish, including design and uh, permit approvals. Uh, we were just shy of the 12 months. We we're about two weeks ahead of schedule. Okay, fantastic. Um, and does the does the tide inundate the boardwalk and it's finished in its finished level? No, no, no. It's a it uh, on the on the current king tides or the spring tides. Um, the highest of the tides uh, touches the underside of the bearer. So there's approximately 350 mils uh, clearance from the bearer to the um, finished surface level of the boardwalk. Okay, and there's a, there's another question here which is, is somewhat related. Has um, uh, potential sea level rises been factored in in the design? And I'm assuming by that answer that it hasn't. Is that correct? That's, that's correct, yeah. No, it wasn't taken into consideration. Um, I think the design life of the uh, boardwalk and the subsequent sea rise in that time frame would have had a you know, little or no effect on the on the finished surface level being adjusted. Yeah, okay, well, that's a it's an interesting one. I would uh, just from Wagner's experience on a previous project or an existing project, I should say. Well, we're doing a lot of work in the Middle East at the moment um, with the Red Sea development and those sort of operators and. It's very important for them to have a sleek uh, finish on on tidal levels um, for the aesthetics that they're chasing, and they've sort of factored in a bit of uh, potential sea level rise resilience in that. In that, due to the modular nature of the structure, a splice connection to raise the pile height can be integrated at any time. Um, so that sort of leads me into one of the other questions, um, and we'll get to some design life things in a minute. But we'll we'll stay with you, Cohen, for a minute um, around. Uh, constructability or maintenance post the design life is there any any thought or any ideas you have at, at this point obviously it's got a, a 50 year design life that was discussed earlier but is there um, ways in which the the steel piles that would have the limp, the smaller of the design life how we could factor that into future maintenance maintenance suggestions or maintenance ideas with the council yeah look due to the due to the design and the modular nature of Wagner's products uh, it's been quite easily to lift off the decks, lift off the joists, remove the headstocks, uh, back out a set of piles or a single pile, reinstall a new one, bear is back in, joist back in, deck back on, and it'd be quite quite a straightforward and simple solution to undertake the you know, considerable structural maintenance for the piles. Okay, very good. And Thomas, we might go over to you now um, and, and give Cohen a bit of a break and jump into the more design questions. Um, what was the area? How did you go about determining the necessary area for the viewing platforms? That's another another question we have from Craig. Uh, the viewing platform that was given to us by council, the size requirements that they wanted. So I think they uh, ended up just shy of six metres by four metres, so about 24 square metres. OK, and uh, one from Fleur here. Um, just if you can provide a bit more commentary on the, the single sided handrail, it's obviously a, an unusual consideration and would have taken a uh, risk assessment or something like that, which Michael's also added here. Do you just want to run us through that bit of a, I know you mentioned earlier it was for connection to the environment, um, but do you want to just run through this a little bit, the, the process that was sort of followed there and, and maybe the thought space in the meetings that were had with the with the client? Yeah, so the uh, the original one had no balustrade whatsoever. So the introduction of a balustrade was um, to increase the accessibility. The risk assessment was carried out using the walking co track based on the fact that the floor was the majority of the time less than a metre. Um, at the end there for the extension, it was greater than a metre, but hence the balustrade all the way around. Um, and then the floor being less than a metre onto a soft medium with uh, easy access out. Uh, in accordance with the walking code, you can avoid a balustrade and you can increase the floor to 1.5 as well. Okay, very good. And that um, was accepted by council following that discussion. Yeah, so it was sort of a, a common sense approach, I guess, in, in that real want to have the integration and the low visual impact on the environment, as well as 
functionality and hitting the right design code. So a bit Absolutely. of a juggle there, I'd imagine. Um, what's the span between the screw screw pairs, and what was the sort of governing factor in the in the maximum span there? That's a question from Prati. Uh, so we ended up about just shy of fifteen hundred between center to center, and it was primarily a function of the excavator to keep all these load all the load paths nice and uh, take as much pressure straight into the screw piles from the joists and bearers as opposed to um, having to transfer those horses through the bearers and yeah, keep them in sizes nice and uh, sort of the correct size where they needed to be and not oversized where they didn't need to be. Okay, well that leads us nicely into one of the further questions. What was the weight of the excavator used? I think, Cohen, you might have mentioned earlier it was a three and a half tonne digger, was it? Correct. Yeah, three and a half, three and a half tonne excavator, yep. Okay. And and what depth were the uh, screw piers in, in steel installed to? Uh, so they were taken to uh, 1800 uh, kPa, and the average depth was approximately four meters. Okay. And uh, on the screw piers again, do they uh, do they only have a maximum design life of 50 years? And and what was the sort of corrosion rate that you allowed for in those? Uh, so the screw piles were designed by um, a specialist, EFA, who we do a lot of work with as well. Um, so it was designed with a minimum 50-year design life based on the highly uh, corrosive environment that we have there. Okay. And well, do I you can't think the exact thickness off the top of my head, but they were sort of the thickest <laughs> steel we could, we could get. Okay. And do you do you anticipate that the, the CFT sleeve, and as Cohen mentioned earlier, the sort of um, prevents its exposure to the tidal inundation or tidal fluctuation zone. Would that have a positive influence on the design life of the of the steel steel piers? Oh, absolutely. The um, the tidal zones where the majority of the corrosion happens um, on particularly on steel screw piles if they're exposed. So similar to the driven steel piles where they they get the UBVC uh, sleeve just to protect it in that um, from that changing. Uh, Tide and um, okay, very good. Back back to you, Cohen. A couple of uh, more constructability style questions. Um, I'll read this one out directly because I'll, I'll follow through. Uh, they run into dilemmas with how to treat cut edges on mini mesh. When the sheets factory width were the sheets factory width to match the deck width, or did you end up cutting them along the nearest long bar um, to get a neat edge? No, we had Wagners or you guys um, that fabricated them in full sheet sizes to full width, so 1.0 overall, three metres long. The only cutting we did was on a change of directions. So we had okay. no, no, basically no exposed, had no exposed cut edges anywhere. Okay, well, that was a question from Hamish, so that's good. Uh, and Fleur, what was, and a question from Fleur, what is the width of the new boardwalk? Was it 1.8 that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, 1.8. And the, the governing factor for that, I, again, I think you mentioned it was to do with uh, dual passage of wheelchairs. Yeah, correct. Okay, fantastic. Uh, let me just run through these questions to check. Coming on, maybe you can't uh, expose or can't uh, let us know the full details, but even ballpark could be fine. How much was the overall cost of the project, and where did you where did you come in in the end in relation to budget that you had allowed? Uh, so the original contract value was uh, 1.98, and I think we came in at uh, uh, 2.1, so we're approximately $100,000 over our contract value, which in the location, uh, with the complexity of the design and the installation, I think was a pretty reasonable outcome. Um, there was only one, I think the only oversight was and which was the major um, contributing factor to that variation was the actual connectivity footpaths from a adjacent car park and the Jervis Bay Marine uh, Maritime Museum, and that contributed to the major increase in the in the project cost. Um, but the boardwalk itself was uh, pretty much to budget and um, to our contract value. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I guess because you were working in a um such a site constraint environment. I'm guessing you manhandled in a lot of the materials. Um, was the was the opportunity to use composites in that or FRP in that environment? Was the the weight selection was that was that a key benefit or a key advantage that you saw? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like the 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 lightweight uh, nature of the um, the Wagner CFT products, quite advantageous in an installation like this. Um, they're all also aesthetically they're, they're they're quite a quite a sleek and um, well finished product in comparison uh, to alternatives. And uh, yeah, that was the main reason for basically constructability, um, ease of construction, and um, the the final aesthetics of the of the of the boardwalk itself. Okay. And was FRP um, specified by the client because of its uh, suitability to a, such a sensitive environment with its non-leaching, non-toxic sort of uh, characteristics and its design life, I guess, for um, less impacts with having to do further construction? Or is that something that, that you put forward? No, very much so. Council um, uh, quite aware of the advantages of using a product like uh, Wagner's FRP and uh, we've utilised it with council on other projects and they, uh, they're they quite fond of it and they see the advantages from both a, um, a longevity of the facility and the environmental impact that the, the product provides. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. And I guess just last question we have here is um, it's from Hamish and I think it's sort of been covered off throughout, but Tom, if you just want to provide a little more commentary on your um, on your pile selection, I know you mentioned uh, particularly it was related to the spoil and the acid sulfate potential, and that's why we couldn't uh, pre-auger holes, which is often the case. And I'm guessing the the reach on the three and a half ton uh, digger would have would have limited your ability to get on top of a, a larger or smaller diameter but longer driven pile. Um, just want to maybe just give us a little more commentary uh, further what you covered off before on that on that pile selection type because I know it's uh, it's often one of the more contentious or one of the more thought through uh, design considerations for for pedestrian infrastructure is the foundation type. Um, yeah. So maybe if you just want to give us a bit more commentary on that, it'd be appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, um, trying to achieve the required loading um, to carry the excavator, which was obviously the worst case loading. Um, the option for yeah we explored different options but as you said the acid sulfate soils the um tricky access the restricted height as well from the mangroves growing over um sort of led us to that direction as the path of least resistance really that was going to be satisfy tick all the boxes if you will and um with with discussion through efa and um we managed to yeah get it working as a steel we were exploring stainless steel screw piles at one point um, but we couldn't get accurate figures on the uh, the corrosive uh, or the rate of corrosion in that environment, and the cost of those was then going to be sort of prohibitive in terms of the um, the option just to go for a steel screw part, which is where we ended up. Yeah, so so maybe at a at a concept level or a first pass, you'd think screw piers are a uh, unusual selection. But when you really delve into it and that sort of real interface with the constructability and the site constraints and the environmental and that's where that sort of uh, solution un unfolded. Absolutely, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, well, fantastic. Well, Kelly, I think that's us through our questions here today. So I really appreciate everyone sure looks like uh, putting those forward and we'll um, yeah pass back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for all of those wonderful questions that came through as well. Um, very, very briefly, I'm just going to share uh, my screen here. I wanted to let you know that the next webinar is on the 23rd of April um, at uh, uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. This one is going to be a really exciting uh, case study. It's our first international case study on Dominion Trail Boardwalk and Bridge for the city of Frisco in Texas, USA. Um, we're going to explore how landscape architects half minimised construction costs and environmental impact to the city's floodplains through the selection of FRP uh, reinforced polymer for construction of that project's boardwalks and bridges. So just use the QR code to register for that event. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at that one as well. We're going to finish up today on uh, the uh, video, wonderful video of Huskisson Boardwalk that we uh, came in on. Uh, but I'd just like to thank um, Cohen and Tom, Thomas Schoen from MI Engineers, Cohen Jerkins from ALI Civil uh, for their presentation today. And thank you very much, General Manager Wagner's CFT, Ryan Leeson, uh, for facilitating the Q&A. Thanks so much for coming. See you again next time.